went to his house one day. Uh, my mum couldn't pick me up for some reason. My mate told me I had to go to speed skating. It was just four years of a bit, bit of mayhem and kind of just trying to learn to skate. And uh, <laughs> I was there. So, yeah, it was kind of a uh, yeah, bit, bit of by accident, completely by accident. So, yeah. Uh, and now I'm sitting here as a two-time Olympian. And I'm quite blessed that that accident did happen. So, yeah, yeah. The Inner Game Podcast. Brought to you by the Science of Excellence. Presented by Rob Hume, the leading elite athlete mental performance coach. Unleash your power. Boom. So, welcome onto the Inner Game podcast. We have with us a two time British Winter Olympian, Farrell Tracy. Farrell's been to the last two Olympics in 2022 um, in China and South Korea. And we've got somebody who, who's coming onto the show who's gonna, who's gonna really uh, delve inside a sport that, that, that many people, myself included, don't really have an understanding of and, and, and try to share how, how the highs and lows of such an unpredictable sport can can affect somebody and 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 I'm sure that Willie's gonna bring out of his own experiences some really powerful wisdom for anybody who who watches and listens uh, to this today. So so thank you again, Will, for, for for coming on the show. No, thank you very much, Rob, for having me on the show. No, I appreciate being here and uh, look forward to what we what we're about to discuss today. Yeah. Yeah. So first of all. I guess where, where I'd love to, to, to begin to understand your story and journey is, is you know, why, why speed skating? How, 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 did, you, how did you start um, in that sport? And uh, we're saying off air how, how, how I've always watched the Winter Olympics from being a kid and, and, and seeing, um, you know, this event in, those, in the Olympics. But we don't, from my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, we don't necessarily have a great tradition, you know, in, in this event. We've had some kind of successes along the way, um, but historically it's something that kind of gets dominated by other countries. Is, is, that, is that a correct representation, would you say? Oh, yeah, definitely correct. We've obviously had some uh, successes in the past, but, yeah, short track speed skating is not a sport that is very popular in the UK or, you know, something that I've been watching and I thought, oh, I have to go out or know anybody that's kind of really like cousins or anyone that's did it and I've done it. Um, no, it is a minority sport in the UK, uh, unlike when you go to some places in Asia, especially South Korea, China, uh, Canada, Netherlands are speed skating crazy. So, um, yeah, when you go to these other countries and you see how much more popular the sport is, you kind of do think, oh, yeah, it's completely different to the UK. Um, for me, getting into the sport was completely by a fluke. Uh, went to secondary school, met somebody on the first year. Um, went to his house one day. Uh, my mum couldn't pick me up for some reason. Uh, they, I think she got stuck in traffic or something along those lines. Um, and my mate told me I had to go to speed skating. And I was like, okay, uh, you're going to have to come along with us. And I was like, okay, well, what? I, I was expecting to go roller skating or something. Uh, we turned up an ice rink. Uh, I was like, okay, <laughs> this is what this is what he's doing. Uh, going to sit in the stands, thinking I'm just going to watch it. And then one of the um, one of the coaches, or one of I think it was actually one of the uh, the uh, coach's parents, actually came up to me and said, "Do you want to have a try?" And I was like, I'm, "I've always been sport crazy, done all the sports: football, cricket, badminton, tennis, any, anything that was available." And I was like, "Yeah, sure." And uh, sitting here as a two-time Olympian. Everyone says, oh, you must have gone on the ice and been a, you know, a natural. But no, couldn't have been further from the truth. Went on, fell about 22 times. And, uh, but I absolutely loved it. So I kept coming back every week. And then uh, it just started building from there. And uh, I started getting selected for teams. And then um, when I was 16, I got invited down to be on the Great Britain team. And it was just four years of a bit, bit of mayhem and kind of just trying to learn to skate. And uh, I was there. So, yeah, it was kind of... Uh, yeah, a bit, bit of by accident, completely by accident. So, yeah, uh, and now I'm sitting here as a two-time Olympian and I'm quite blessed that that accident did happen. So, yeah, yeah. That, that, that is amazing. I, I love it when I, when I hear those stories like that where you, 
where you just cannot predict something like that. You know how how and that's what I love about life, if I'm honest. How how just the uncertainty can you know often people kind of get can be afraid of uncertainty and and, and, and the random events that come, but that random event there changed the direction of your life forever, hasn't it? Yeah, completely. Yeah, did hundred percent, and um, yeah. So it is kind of weird about that in life, and it's you know I think yeah you kind of realise these weird coincidences kind of can sometimes happen for the best, and obviously sometimes you know may may not work out, but yeah no it, it is strange to look back and see that this is kind of the result of that. So yeah, it's yeah it is very strange. So yeah. How so? Can you just uh, go into a little more detail, just uh, um, and and explain how uh, how you then progressed? Obviously, you mentioned I think uh, sixteen that, that that you got into you know GB squad, but for you know as I was saying um, about how uh, how much more of a minority sport this is. How did how did you transition up through just going to that 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 rink that day and, and then? get into you know a team and then competitions what what does that look like to even get to the point where then you know kind of a national selector or a, a, a trial even becomes a possibility how, how does that progress up yeah 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 so um obviously it didn't just go from me not not being able to skate into the obviously just being onto the national team it kind of uh for the first couple of maybe weeks or months it was just an element of trying to learn how to skate uh trying to get my bearings on the ice um and then you start to do that and then you start to try and uh almost move up the groups in your club dynamic and and obviously speed skating's there's a there's a couple of elements of balance um obviously fit uh, physical ability and f- physical fitness and stuff but um and then also technical ability with the the specifics of trying to do speed skating fast and like learning the equipment uh, because also the equipment is a bit different to the, the normal skates you'll get at your normal ice hockey or higher place where it'll be a blade that's kind of the length of your your sh- your shoe or something with speed skating we actually have um, 17 inch blades going up to 18 inch blades so they're actually very much longer than your shoe so um, almost finding the balance on that and then when you're speed skating trying to move around the, the balance of the radius and, and the blade is kind of like a technique in itself. So th- there are quite a few of elements that you have to kind of, you have to learn as you go through. So all that period is trying to, to work that, but also getting the physical adaptation to be stronger and fitter and stuff, which I kind of got from that. That, that was an element that was a problem because I, I, I did football, tennis, loads of sports before. So I felt like I was a pretty fit person. So that wasn't really a problem. It was just more, the speed skating technique and actual ice skating technique as well that I kind of had to learn. And that was, that was always going to be the major fact, even to the point when I came onto the team. And uh, I remember the national coach saying one of the first, first week where they got us to do a, like just a normal skating drill and I couldn't do it whatsoever. And the national coach saying, what is he doing here? He can't skate. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so, so that, that, that was, that was to the element of like, of how much I had, I kind of had to kind of catch up with the rest of, you know, my peers. And I kind of had to maybe take a little bit of a shortcut um, and, and kind of deal with some things. So even when I'm on the national team early, early days, I had to, I was actually prescribed by the coaches to go on the normal sessions uh, with the general public to develop my skating ability a little bit more. Um, uh, but, it, but in, in, in those years, uh, going into the um, up to 16, going into the national team, um, I was always behind the curve, so I always missed the uh, talent ID identification camps and stuff like that because I was just a little bit underneath all my peers. And it was only when I was like 15, 15, 16, that I, I always had a growth spurt as well at that period as well that kind of helped me. Um, I then kind of came up above uh, my other peers and everyone in my age category and even even some people below that were very good in the age categories below, then I started to jump above them. Uh, and then I went to a trials, kind of one of uh, the GB trials. And uh, no, no one had seen me for like maybe a couple of months and everyone was shocked to see I was, a, I was, had a growth spurt. And then also the times I was doing, and then it was kind of then the, the national coaches came up to me and started having a conversation. Um, so 
and then I was invited on camps and then I went to the World Junior Championships even when I was at, at school. So um, Australia, which was a fantastic World Junior Champs to go to as your first one, first trip away, uh, all the way to Australia, you know, the winter, <laughs> the winter capital. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that, that was a great holiday. That was um, maybe not the best competition in the world. I went all the way over to uh, Australia to do a relay and I, um, I did one lap and fell over. So maybe not the best as the competition wise, but for experience, it was absolutely fantastic. And anyway, for me, it was actually a very building moment for me to understand like, oh, I've gone to a big competition like that as, or as my first international competition and to kind of deal with failure as well. Like uh, also knowing that all your mates at school all know you're going to this massive competition and they want to know how you did and uh, having to come back and tell them, yeah, I fell after a lap. <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't, wasn't the easiest, I'm going to be honest. So yeah. So yeah, it was kind of like just it. It was for me. It was kind of like trying to just keep up with everybody, and then I had a growth spurt, and then it was kind of like, oh my god, there you go. Uh, so yeah, um, and I, I kind of always knew that I loved the sport. It was something completely different, and um, yeah, then it was it was lucky that it kind of all fell fell into place when I was about sixteen, and then I got all the invites. So, and then it kind of yeah, then I was on the national team, and I kind of got looked after by the program after that. So yeah. Nice. So when you were saying uh, how when you first got invited down to the national program and uh, you were saying that the coaches kind of was looking at going, you know, he's in some way technically is behind the others and they, they kind of put you in another group. There was obviously still something though, even though you were, were behind technically, you obviously had something in some other area which which got you into that position, didn't it? Yeah. Didn't you? What, yeah. what was it that you think that, that even though you was behind all these other, I'm guessing a, a, a big part of it was that you came into skating compared to the other skaters older, you know, they probably started it a few years before you. So the fundamentals were there for them and you were just kind of <laughs> waiting to catch up on that. But the, you obviously to even get to there at that stage after a short period of time, it, it is really impressive, isn't it? You know, so what was it that that got you even to there, even though you was behind technically? Do you think? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah. Because like even even people that say they started at the same age as me, they normally had a background in roller skating or figure skating or something ice hockey. So they normally had a, a had a base level of speed of skating whatsoever. So yeah, so. I, I don't know, and 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 also that that was that was something that I kind of I don't know I I had to battle when I was younger in the program because obviously these coaches are saying I have fantastic talent and I could you know they're, they're trying to tell me to dream bigger and go for it more and 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 all this but I like, I couldn't see the difference between myself and a couple of the others and I was like so you so you're just telling that to everybody and that was kind of like a, an element of trying to wrap my head about what they were seeing in me as well. So, uh, so, uh, that, that, that was also an element of like, at the time I didn't know, but, uh, I guess, I guess at that time, my, I could see tactics a little bit, bit more differently than my peers. They even asked me at times to, 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 to run sessions for them and do stuff for that in that kind of respect. And, and I, I didn't quite get it at the time. I didn't understand why they'd want me to do it. You're the coach. It's like, why would you want me to do that? So, um, but yeah, I, I, at the time I didn't really know, but they obviously saw that I was off the ice. I was, I guess, very good. I was very good physically from a running standpoint and like biking standpoint. So I guess they always just thought he's got a limiting factor on the ice. So if we could improve that limiting factor and we can get all the the, the, the properties that he has off the ice uh, from his running and his cycling, he's going to then turn into the speed skater that we think he can be. So, and I guess I guess maybe that was a good sign that the the national coaches yeah. being like this guy can't even skate and he's made it to the national team. So <laughs> if he, skate, yeah. So you should see me try and skate backwards. That's the one question that everyone asks me can you that's normally one of the questions they ask me can you skate backwards and I'm like still to this day not very well so yeah well, <laughs> even, even it's a good, it's a good job the race only requires you to skate forwards so who yeah. cares about going backwards eh <laughs> and left because I can't skate right very well at all so <laughs> I guess yeah that's the one way around, isn't it yeah nice exactly. 
But Wait. you know, who would ask you saying, Paul, can you can you show me how fast you can run backwards? And if he, if he can't run backwards, that that, that makes him a lesser sprinter. It, it doesn't mean anything. He's only got to go that way. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. But I bet you we can run much better backwards than I can skate backwards. So, yeah. <laughs> it's slightly more technical, though, uh, obviously, to uh, <laughs> to do that. I've only been skating once, and that was a disaster a long, long time ago. So uh, God only knows how how you're how you're doing it, Farrell. Um, just just to touch on uh, something that interests me when you're speaking about the the length of the skates. It, I'm presuming that, that that the smaller the length of the of the blade, does that increase your speed? Just the longer the length, go from 17 to 18, would, would that create more friction and therefore slow you slow slow you down, but give you more grip? What, what what's the kind of like thinking behind having that slightly longer versus shorter shorter uh, blade? Blade. Okay. Well, well. For example, the whole reason why we have longer blades is basically it's. It, it, it's, it's kind of a trade-off. Um, so obviously what you're saying about friction is obviously going to be there, but it, you, get, you get more glide with a longer blade. So if you have a longer blade, you get more glide, but the only trade-off that you then have is you have less agility. And if you've watched speed skating before, you kind of need to be able to fit into small gaps, kind of maneuver at times, be quite fast at, at some times. And um, so, so when, you're, when you're picking your blade equipment and it goes down to some people even have 17.75 17.25 because they want this little bit extra and some people even move their blade a little bit more forward on their boot so backwards it gets very technical even some people have almost like stilts where they they put on the back heel of their blade like a lengthener so they're pretty much on their toes most of the time yeah. so but they're, they're, they're almost trying to get something for them personally. Obviously, it's either a weakness or it's a strength, and they want to exaggerate it now. So for, for me, um, I'm one of the tallest in the category. Uh, normally, short track speed skaters are quite small. Uh, thinking when I was younger, uh, and I get told by loads of people that I was too small to do tennis and football and all these, these sports, I was thinking, oh, finally, I found a sport that being small is good at. And then I grew into a six foot two person at 16, so it didn't really work out there either. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but with so for me, I choose an eighteen-inch blade, and maybe we never know. Might might go even longer in the in the future, but that's because I'm 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 a skater that likes the glide, so I want to use that glide and that 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 length of the blade to make me more efficient in the race yeah. compared to other other athletes. And then obviously, smaller athletes are normally going to choose a smaller blade because it's easier for them to be agile with. So if they if somebody who was five foot two per se, uh, had an 18-inch blade, they would find that very big on their foot. Yeah, and agility would then suffer. Yeah. So it's kind of, you have a trade-off, really, kind of on that, on that yeah. respect. So. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, thank, thank, thanks for that. Um, no worries. Just, uh, just quickly, I'll let, I'll let it this bit out, Farrell. It seems like you're more kind of looking across at me. Oh, sorry, right? sorry. You get it either, I don't know if... Not quite sure. Yeah, there. That, that's it. Cool. No, 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 no. The camera. <laughs> I, I do that. I'm very bad at that. I'm very bad at like looking out into the, the windows over there. So that's probably what I'm looking at. So yeah. <laughs> so I'll keep, I'll keep I'll focus to the camera. Cool. Um, what's what's the what's most important to you about your sport and speed skating? What is it that 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 you take from it? That 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 drives you to keep wanting to do it i believe that people have different reasons um which you know draws them to their sport there's, there's different things which um resonate with with athletes and their sport in different ways and i'm curious to know what is it that's most important for you about 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 what about what you do in and in, 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 in this sport um for well, just just for general um, in sport and just in general, that's why why I love sport when I was younger was just I guess the competition side of it all. Uh, I, ever since I've been young, I've just loved competition. Want to make everything into a competition. So I guess I guess that part. And I've always been like, make sure you you always love what you do and stuff like that. And so making being a speed skater and growing old and being 
in that competition kind of environment is just something I've always loved. I've always loved knowing that I've got a race coming up and that I can kind of be in that heat of the battle kind of thing. So, and I've always loved that from, from an early age. So, and, and, and specifically with my sport, it's, uh, I, I don't know. It's, uh, the reason why I also love, like for my second favorite sport is probably football. And I love football because you get that element of, it's either you chew against that other team you've got to beat that or you've got to outsmart that other team or you've got to outpace or whatever you're going to do or even if you part the bush you've got to outmaneuver out tactic that other team and, and and that's what I love about speed skating it's all about that race it doesn't matter it doesn't matter like draws are fantastic like they, they can be incredibly frustrating if you get a terrible draw but incredibly good if you obviously get a fantastic draw and you've got a good race because it doesn't matter if the race before you went faster all you have to do is beat the other four or five people in your race. You know what I mean? You've got to outmaneuver, out tactic them. Or e- even to the point where sometimes it feels great being like, I didn't win the race, but I maneuvered in a point where all I knew I had to come third or had to come second to qualify. And I've qualified. I'm through to the next round, you know, because, yeah, I could have done everything to win the race, but I saved some energy just because I knew there's going to be more rounds coming up. And I, 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 I out tactic and knew that all I had to do for this race was to come there so and, 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 and that's what I kind of love about my sport is that it is kind of like you're up against the other man and you've got to try and out and even got a race and, and they're right in front of you and making that overtake and making it happen is kind of one of the best feelings ever when you get a race completely right it's, it's a fantastic feeling when you've to the point where you literally can almost because you know your, your, your fellow athletes so well and their tactics so well that you you literally know exactly what they're going to do and then plan against it. So like, like I always think it's like a chess game. You've always got to know what your opponent's going to do and try and move accordingly. So, and then, and then with the element of maybe the sport, the the bit of the sport I don't like is the incredibly physical part, which sometimes, yeah, isn't nice to train for. But at the end of the day, like when you do a hard day of, of training, that good feeling comes. So, there are times where I do feel like I love my sport and love what I do because you come back from a day's training and just be like, I'm absolutely exhausted, but you feel fantastic for it. So, yeah. yeah. And there are some times where you wake up on the Wednesday morning and you are in bits and thinking, <laughs> how I finish this week? There is no chance I'm going to finish this week. You know what I mean? It's a bit of a trade-off there again. So, yeah. Yeah, th- thank you for, for sharing that, Farrell. I, uh, I think there's something that you touched on there, which I think has to be part of, 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 of any any sports person, no matter what level they are at, at the, at the core of it, there has to be this real like love and enjoyment for for the sport. Um, because without that, there's there's not enough there to, to pull you through the, those painful days, whether it be painful training or the emotional pain from from an event not quite going the way that you you want it to go. It has to be something more than 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 that more more than just winning, more than just doing it. There has to be this this real sense of pleasure in, in doing it. Um, and this is certainly something I really emphasise with the athletes that I work with, and because sometimes. One of the things that that's getting in the way of their performance is that th- their love for what they're doing starts to starts to wane, and it, it becomes more painful in some way. Not just the physical pain of you know the training, but but the emotional pain. You know, or the setbacks of things going wrong, the setbacks of being released or let go of some kind of club or program, or you know, the the, the emotional pain of, of 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 a coach or somebody saying something to you, and it. And it if that that balance starts to tilt more towards like the negative than the, than for the love of what you're doing, that's when it becomes hard to train. You know, people start saying, you know, they're struggling to get up for it. It's becoming harder and harder. And you've just got to, at the back of your mind, when you've just had that, that really, you know, uh, challenging training session, and then you've got to go again the next day, it's the love for the sport that gets you up the next day, surely, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I tell you, if you you if you said you love your sport, sometimes when I wake up on that yeah, on the Friday, you know, morning or something, when I've got obviously a horrible day of training, I'm feeling terrible. I might not answer the same way. <laughs> 
but nah but like i guess deep down is that's the reason why i do it and like that is the thing that you need to always keep and yeah no i, I totally agree with you and um and making sure you keep a kid within is is always you know always important and and the, and the reasons why you do things yeah very important as well so yeah 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 no definitely could you um could you get, when when you're talking about there um these really challenging training sessions what 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 does it what, what does one of these or some of these look like are you talking about on the ice training or are you talking about the stuff that you're doing off the ice with the extra strengthening and conditioning well where where are the, those real physical you know challenges to train and what 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 what's it what's that look like for you in your in your sport yeah yeah so for me well it, i guess when you speak to everybody when you speak to all athletes it's it's completely different from athlete to athlete but for me personally it's laps it's the lap sessions on the ice um that is when the coach will make us do maybe up to 180 laps in a session you know um for me uh that is just uh also I, i'd also use the excuse that i'm a heavier athlete i'm going to be having to work harder lap to lap to lap to lap uh, i've got bigger legs as well to move around um so and also to get into the position i i have to go further so these are all the excuses that i use on a day-to-day basis <laughs> yeah. the moment, everyone else how it's harder for me uh but yeah um for me it's just it's just that elements of it's just lap after lap after lap after lap and we have to sit in a almost like a 90 degree bend on the knee and even further and you are there for up to seven minutes, seven minutes in total. And almost like, so try it for anybody watching at home wants to understand the pain that you go through, go and just to make it a little bit easier for you, use the wall and go into a 90 degree bend on your legs and then try and seven minutes and see how that feels. Because that, 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 that's what we kind of have to do. And that's kind of set after set. And we maybe even have to do six, eight sets of that in a row. And it, it can get, it can get awful at times. So, and and for me, it's just it's just a battle with myself at that point. It's just a battle with myself of the in, the the voice in your head saying you can't possibly do this. But then for somehow, when I think when I'm when I'm five laps into a twenty seven lapper, and I'm thinking I'm in bits here, there's no way I can complete it. And then you get to the end of twenty seven laps, and I made it. You do think, well, I can actually do more than I can. But you've you've still got to have that battle with your brain and your legs are burning up and you've got to to survive with that lactic acid just being there and you're swimming in it um and you've just got to try and find something so yeah and then and they are they end up being incredibly emotional like exhausting sessions because you are just literally fighting with yourself to keep yourself going um so yeah so i absolutely hate them and i know this is the day it's going to absolutely hurt and not one bit of the session i'm going to enjoy because for me i love going back and i love overtaking and with these lap sessions we keep to a certain lap time so we can make the laps yeah. so we don't get the element of the speed yeah. that you no, that enjoy <laughs> exactly and you can't do the overtakes because you're absolutely dead so it's 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 basically cutting the joy out of short track speed skating for me, but but I know that this is something that I have to do so that when I get to a competition that I can perform to my best. So it's kind of like it's just something that I know I'm just gonna have to tell my chimp um, uh, that I, I have to I have to do so and uh, get on with it. So yeah, um, but yeah, there they are days that I absolutely hate, and I would trade if somebody could give me something and just say we'll give you that lap strength you don't have to do it i'd make that trade 100 so yeah but, well yeah. there are things there are techniques that 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 can help with that and um, this is a big reason why i do what i do with that that there are there are shortcuts to developing physically mm. through developing mentally through de- developing ne- neurologically and um, I give you a, a prime example of that, and I spoke about this quite a few times. That one of the great things that we have as humans is the prefrontal cortex, that the, the grey layered 
uh, areas of our brain. That's the thing that allows us to imagine things, imagine things that aren't even real, to, to daydream about things, to, to imagine the future, to, to forward plan a race, an event of, of some kind. And there's been quite a few experiments uh, uh, looking at that, where they took two groups of, of, of people. It's been done in, in piano playing, weight training, uh, basketball, um, and another one. And essentially they split into two groups and then for roughly around the month, might be a bit longer in some studies than the other, one group, they go away and, they, and for like half an hour a day, three to four times a week, they go away and physically do their thing. They physically go and practice playing the piano for half an hour. They physically go and, and lift weights for half an hour. They physically go and shoot basketballs for half an hour. Then they have a, the other group. They are going away for 30 minutes and they do not lift a, f a finger. They do not throw a basketball. They do not lift a weight and they do not um, touch any piano. But they are mentally rehearsing, imagining, really getting into the state of, 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 of performing those techniques and then repeating and rehearsing that in their mind. And then after whatever period of time, a month, a few weeks, they then bring them back together and then they test them. They test their physical strength for the weight training group. They test the piano playing ability. They test the ability to shoot uh, basketball hoops. And there is next to no difference between either group. You're talking like two or 3% difference. And one group hasn't even physically done a thing. And that, that, that those studies have been repeated time and time again. And th this is why, you know, a big part of what I do in, in helping athletes prepare for big events is, is, is creating the neurology ahead of time of, of what it is that they're going to do. And because the brain doesn't know the different, I can't explain how or why this is uh, the way that it is, but the brain, the mind does not know the difference between what is imagined and what is actually happening. Hence why when you have a, a, a vivid dream, in that moment, whilst you're sleeping, having that dream, it, it, it feels like it's real, doesn't it? And the same way, in the same way for that, because that, that same uh, process works with visualization and, and so teaching athletes exactly how to visualize to get in the neurophysiological state where they can optimally perform is it massively cuts corners for people um, in that if somebody, if somebody has raced the same race 10 times, 20 times, 30 times before they go and physically do it, that is a huge advantage. And when a, when a brain, when the mind has done that 10, 20, 30 times before they go and race, it's almost like they can just slot straight into it because as I said, it doesn't know the difference between that imagined experience and the real one. So visualizing and, and knowing how to visualize and getting in the state to visualize is, is really powerful for, for, for any athletes. And I'm just wondering if, if, if this is something that, that you, you try to bring in with, with, with what you do before you go to competitions and, and, and train. Yeah, yeah, it's it has been something actually recently in the last couple of years that I've been speaking with a, a psychologist about doing it, uh, visualizing more. And um, I, I did it before when I was younger, um, anyway. But obviously, trying to do it in a, in a better way, where I would I would kind of visualize my race, but I wasn't intending of doing it for the for the reason you were talking about. I was just doing it because that was something I always did. Yeah. Um, but I was trying to use it as a training tool before with my psychologist and. Uh, and it, even to the point where the psychologists would try and get me to imagine the smell or the or the kind of like the sound of the, the venue that I'd be at and trying to get your brain convinced that you are there. Um, so it, it was something that I always struggled with because I always struggled just to stay still just on a general, just for 10 minutes straight. But uh, yeah, um, it was something that I tried, but I, I, I don't believe I mastered at this point, but I'm, I'm, I'm obviously going to still try and do it because... I, I can see the difference and then one of a couple of my best races have been from when I've obviously done some quite a, quite a considerable amount of visualization before. And um, so, yeah, 
So, and then went on to compete quite well. So I get, I get for me, for the reason why I used to visualize before was just to almost get myself ready for that race before to almost get myself in that kind of race mode. Yeah. So that, that was almost the reason why I would use it before racing and stuff, but I was trying to do it in training just to, to, to get me in that mindset of, yeah. to use it. And it's also, yeah, no, interesting that you brought it up. Yeah. Something else that you said, and one of the big parts of this podcast is is is, is trying to get the the insights from from what what athletes like you do. And you mentioned when you've got those tough training sessions, and you know it's going to be physically painful. That lactate is building up, as you said, being in something like but far more challenging than a skier squat for seven minutes and then and, and then having to. <laughs> <laughs> do it for repeated bouts of seven minutes. You, you say that, that that you are having in your mind the, 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 this battle between you know the pain being too much and, and this part of you, and that this is another thing that, that I often help athletes with. Have this. They, people talk about these parts. There's a part of me that wants to quit. There's a part of me that obviously wants to keep going. And 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 an athlete will quit or will not perform at their best if, if that part that is perceiving the pain is too much. If that overtakes, it will ultimately, at a subconscious level, it will pull that person back. It, it, it will because one of the deeper mechanisms of the mind is, is to protect. So even something simple like training, if, if, if somebody is doing a really painful training session and somebody is – if their internal talk is is quite negative, you know, if they're saying things like, you know, this is killing me, this is tough, this is hard, this, if that self talk gets in there, that that the subconscious mind believes that it, it, it believes that this is killing me, this is painful, this is too tough, and it will cause them to to back off in some way. How is it that you, you know, get control over that in your head when you're saying like? I don't think I can keep doing this, but obviously you do. How do you how do you win that that game, the the, the inner game in, in, inside your mind in, in moments like this? Yeah, yeah, it's it's obviously going to be it's, it's different for everyone. And it's obviously hard. It's it's one of the hardest things. I think it is the hardest thing in, in sport to do is literally battle yourself. Um, for me, I, I I I I've used the chin paradox from a psychologist that I work with. And he kind of introduced me to the whole chin paradox, and uh, it was it was kind of a game changer for me. Um, so the chin paradox is basically that the inner thought, or the inner voice in your head, is the chin is obviously trying to protect you, and it's obviously from uh, loads of people will know what the chin paradox is. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and basically, for me, for one of the things as well with the chin paradox that I've kind of developed over the years is like. Um, is what you're talking about in the race where it putting you down. I kind of try and address it as early as possible. Uh, so when, you know, you get those butterflies before you go on for the race, I try and understand that, or like the self-doubt talk, or like the chimp almost talking in your head going, you know, I don't think you're going to do it, you know what I mean? Or kind of make, put you down, like, I don't think you're ready for racing or, or all these other things. For me, when that kind of thing's happened now, uh, I, I moved on to the point where it's like, this is just my brain working well so it was almost like i would then do a switch and be like no th th this is fine this is my brain almost doing the correct thing that my brain is programmed to do so it was almost like a realization where i would then just go no my brain is doing exactly what it's meant to do this is exactly what's happening and it would almost be a switch for me so when the chimp would then just get really quiet because it would almost be like oh there's no danger here and I'm, I'm kind of almost logically telling my chimp there's no danger here i know you're there and you are doing this chat because you're a defense mechanism for me and you're working how you should do. And then that would be an element of almost getting that voice in my head to just dial down massively before I even go on for the race. And then I can concentrate on what I have to do when I go onto the ice. So that, that, that was a big, for me, a big game changer that I really worked in, in the last couple of years of trying to do is almost just go, yeah, this, this voice is normal. And this voice is part of me and, you know what I mean? And I know it's there for a reason. And, yeah, just almost have like a bird's eye view of the whole situation and kind of tell myself, even in that pressured performance environment. Uh, and it kind of helped me understand it a bit better when I'm, I'm going on for racing. So, yeah. 
Yeah, far on that, that. You, how you describe that, you know, is it, fantastic. You know, for, for anybody who, who who is watching this, and that, that and this, what I was talking about here applies in any sport, and not even just sport. You know, in life, going for a job interview, that that chimp will come on. Going, you know, giving a presentation in front of people, that chimp can come on. It doesn't have to. And and, and as you said there, Farrell, you was able to rationalise, negotiate with that part of your mind, that that chimp part, the the amygdala, the really emotional part of the brain, which is it, which is essentially there, as, as we said, to to protect you in some way. And, and if if the mind thinks that a training session or an event uh, or a person is a threat in some way, the, the freeze, fight, or flight mechanism comes on. And if that comes on, no athlete will ever pl- perform at, at their best. And it, it seems like the work that you, you've done there um, with yourself and with your, your, your sports psychologist there has, has really helped you to, I think, A, it sounds like you, you understand kind of what's happening and in, in being able to understand what's happening in here, you can then logically kind of break that down. And as you said, you, you know, turn it down. And, and I actually teach athletes how to turn that voice down. And, and you've obviously found out a way of doing it yourself because you can, any athlete, any person can learn how to turn the volume of that, that talk down. And if it, if it get the louder it gets, the more it's perceiving that there's a, a, a greater danger there. And, and when you can, rather than trying to avoid it and rather than try and fight with that voice, as you said, one way, which you even spoke about there, is to listen to it. Listen to your own voice and acknowledge it, and, you know, and, 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 and speak to it as if it's your friend. Speak to it as if it's somebody there who's actually trying to look out for you and say things to, to yourself. It might sound a little silly, uh, silly to, to some people um, but but say you know I, I, I appreciate what, what, what you're doing here I can hear what you're saying and I understand why you're trying to do this and I know that you're just trying to look out for me in some way but but everything is okay that there is no threat here there is no danger here and, and being able to uh, negotiate with it acknowledge it negotiate allows you to then kind of let go and, and the next phase which you described there is is to dissociate because the, the the flow state, which is where athletes perform at their greatest, when 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 an athlete does this, they're actually in they're actually disassociated from their own identity because it's one's identity which gets in the way of their ability, their talents to come out um, and being able to dissociate out out of that. Out of your identity, that part of your mind which which can get you know um, scared, which can feel inferior, which can can overanalyze. If you can disassociate from that, as I said, that 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 identity, then it's like a freeway for you, a path for you, all those subconscious skills and techniques that you've learned to to literally come out of you, so that the mind is just clear to just just. For you just to go and skate and do your thing. Yep, definitely, definitely, definitely. Seriously. Mm. On, on on that note, since we're talking about it, can 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 you remember your 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 best ever performance? What when you think back to this, what does that look like and feel like for you when 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 something when you just when you just nailed it when it just when it just fell? I. I I did something special this day. Can, can you remember an, an event or events like like this? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's always hard because obviously yeah, I'm a very critical person. Uh, so it's it's like it, everyone talks about when that race happened or anything like that. But, but I, know, I know what you mean with the flow state of uh, getting into that mode of almost being on autopilot. Um, and it's obviously happened quite a few times. There's been a couple of races where it's just been like almost instinctive and it's just been like, I haven't thought about it. And it's just like, I've just made the move or I've made the move then. And it's kind of been like in perfect timing. Uh, but there, there, there has been a couple of occasions, but I don't know, for me, it's when it doesn't go that way that you really, you do, you do see the difference in the stands. 
the other side of it when you are just thinking way too much and that everything is then a struggle and you are just almost like the way I see it is like uh, you're, you're trying to go through a, a to-do list in a day and it's almost like you're, you're trying to get rid of all the, the, the thoughts in your head while you're racing and it's just nothing's clearing and everything is just then hard work and you're trying to battle everything where when something's gone perfectly or the race has gone really well, it's just almost like you're, you are just free from all thought and it is just everything is instinctive. But I think it... I, one, 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 one particular point where I feel like I really got it um, in a very high pressured uh, place was the uh, World Cup. That was, it was almost needed for Olympic qualification. It was like for one of the first times I was on the season circuit and we needed to get an Olympic qualification. So top 22, it was like one of the, the um, things that the BOA needed. So it was kind of like a big thing in my head where I was just like, I just want to get rid of these top 22s, trying to almost get my clearance from the BOA so then I can go into the next season absolutely fine. Uh, and I went into a race at the time, the world champion, one of my idols, I Charles Hamlin. And uh, I basically, I'm going to bring up visualization. I literally visualized exactly what he was going to do in the race and then knew exactly what I was then going to do to, against him. But uh, against him, but actually to use him as well. So that's another part in short track where you can actually use other skaters to draft them, obviously, the, use their thing, but also use their tactic to work in your favour um, uh, to the point where I literally knew exactly what he was going to do and knew he was going to come back in the so I was going to overtake him in the race and knew he was going to like that and he was going to try and overtake him in the next two laps. And it worked literally to, according to plan. And I, I remember the race being so short. It was like the shortest thousand meters I've ever done. Didn't even, didn't hurt that much either because everything was just, it was almost like I'd been there before, done it before. And it was kind of like you'd watch the movie for the fifth time or something. So um, yeah, probably that, that, that was in a scenario where I was just, just doing moves and I was completely confident that I was going to do it. Didn't even think about it. And it was kind of like, I had no doubts going into it. It was an element of, I'm going to be honest, if I could get that feeling every time I go out racing, I'd, I'd, I'd bottle it up. But uh, yeah, it was kind of like a mo um, it was autopilot. That, that's the only way I'd, I'd be able to describe it. So yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, you, you described it really well. And um, yeah, you, you're talking about being in, in, in the flow state there. There's no doubt about it. And one of the common, um, traits of being in the flow state is the, the the loss of sense of time again it's because you in order to do that the, the mind is dis disassociated almost from the body from the identity because outside of of outside of the human mind the time doesn't exist if that makes sense it's only we humans which is keeping track of time. So when someone gets into a flow state, which is a, a deeper level of trance, it's all the flow state is only a few kind of hertz higher up than than, than sleep. When it's almost like a, when somebody first goes to bed and they're a bit alert and they start coming down uh, and, and those brain waves gradually start that start dropping it um, starts in a beta brain wave state and then it goes down to, to alpha. And then there's this point where 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 when you're going to sleep, where you where you're still kind of awake, but not that right there is is like the threshold between what is the alpha brain waves um, frequency and the theta, and in that 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 crossover, that junction from alpha to theta, that is that is the flow state. That is where all great performances from any athlete reside. They've been able to calm their mind down. And if, if somebody can't get calm, they can't relax their brain to relax their body so they can go and let out the, the ability and nerves, doubts, anger and frustration is the antithesis of the flow state. And uh, that's why it's so important to be able to have that, that, and that heightened state of relaxed focus there's some of the other key key traits and being able to get into that mode and the, for me listening to what you uh described there there's no doubt about it that that what enabled you to get to that point was the fact that you was 
you obviously knew because he because that skater was like one of your heroes. You'd grown up watching him. You knew, you'd probably in your past modelled him in some way, you know, and tried to adopt some of his performance traits. And because you knew that so well, and because you then rehearsed your race, it it was it was becoming second nature to the point where you you probably even making moves which you've never even practiced before. That, that that's another common kind of theme of the flow state that that this spontaneous creativity comes where like people perform skills techniques do things that never before in their life have they, have they done and it certainly seems like there you was able to hold it in, in into that far yeah yeah no no it sounds sounds about right sounds about perfectly so yeah you probably described it much better than i did so yeah <laughs> um Let's just um, change the direction a little bit, Farrell, because I know you've had some, you know, big challenges um, in your career so far. Can you what what's what's some of what of or some of the, the the biggest setbacks or challenges where where things haven't gone gone your way in, in your career so far? And uh, you know what what was this like, and how 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 have you dealt with it? Yeah. yeah um... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess I guess every athlete has setbacks and challenges, obviously, um, and uh, everyone has the what ifs. All athletes do. Um, but uh, yeah, I've had I've had quite a few injuries over the past, uh, you know, over the past kind of like span of my career. Uh, and I think uh, like with those, the, I think every athlete knows the worst point for an athlete is when they're injured, is when they can't do the thing that they kind of love doing and want to do. So yeah, as 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 a general, that's always a, a big thing, and 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 for the many injuries that I've had, you know, it's always been a kind of a a feeling of like, oh, yeah, trying trying to get over them, trying to move forward and, and rehab from it as well. But like from a mental point of view, it's always kind of always been a a bit a bit hard as well to try and come back from that. And uh, but like I also feel like those injuries and those points have been kind of defining points, especially the first time I broke, uh, I broke my arm quite, quite, quite severely. Uh, I've had two operations on it, broke it in a um, uh, main place, uh, midway down my uh, left arm, and then also uh, shattered it pretty much up to the elbow uh, to the point where they had to put a metal bar in, uh, like let it heal. I was out for like about four months. Uh, and in those four months, it was just, uh, I guess, a lot of kind of, finding out of a little bit like uh do, do I want to keep doing this sport you know uh, I kind of realized how dangerous it was uh I feel like before I was kind of this naive kind of young athlete that didn't really understand the the dangers of speed skating and then uh when I saw my arm when I thought it was just dangling next to me and then seeing it the other side of my head flapping over here I kind of realized that uh that uh, yeah, this is a dangerous sport, and that if if it goes wrong, I could really hurt myself at some point. So I guess I guess that 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 was an element that I obviously had to deal with, but also just to deal with the fact that I'd, I'd be out for four months. I was only on the team for I think about two years at that point, and I'm missing four months of you know training of potential ability to you know move up. Um, so yeah, I think it really it really focused me and really understood of like oh, you know. Like, uh, I, I kind of, in that four-year cycle, I kind of always remembered periods of that time of how bad I felt or how bad or how much I wanted it. And it was kind of like a move back to how, how did you feel then? And that was kind of motivation then for my training in that point. So as it was terrible for me in my actual development, it was kind of like something that I would then hold on to in my training period in into the lead up to South Korea, which was my first Olympic Games. And I still think it was a big factor in sort of how I managed to do those those periods of, of, of time of training where I'm talking about it being awful and horrible at times. Um and and the ability to push through that because I kind of realized that I remember those dark days when I was really injured and, you know, trying to trying to recover from my uh, from my um my arm break that, you know, no, this is what I want to do. This is this is this is what I want to do because I've been through those times where I've been pleading that my arm was okay and I could do the sport I want and the sport I love. So yeah, yeah, no, it was definitely definitely like a uh, like a 
a big moment in my career, I'd say, and something that I always, even to this day, remember those times where I was walking to training, uh, doing ridiculous amount of rehab on my arm and just absolutely not not enjoying life basically at that point and, and wishing that I was, you know, going to World Cups or going to these competitions and seeing all my peers doing it. So, yeah, no, definitely, definitely always a period. And, I, and you hear a lot of athletes always talk about time on the sideline and being a, a deciding factor of almost being pulled out of the environment that, you know, you love. And, and, and for athletes, it's sometimes hard, the daily grind. So, you know, uh, I think sometimes you don't appreciate what you have until obviously, you know, it's gone. So, yeah, that, that, that was a period for me that I always kind of look back on and uh, refocus myself. So, yeah. Yeah, I, th- I, think, I think you're describing something which is, I think is... It's right up, up there. I, I, with a lot of the work that I do, I, I, I work with athletes with emotions, um, using emotions and, and, and harnessing them. And, and what I think, correct me if I'm wrong, please, Farrell, uh, that it seemed like that, that, that moment of all that rehab, all that struggle, it made you more, it made you grateful for, for, for what you had before it and, and almost more grateful um, going forwards. Would, would that be would that be how you would d- describe it? I think, yeah, yeah. maybe, maybe on, a, on a day-to-day basis, like uh, you get stuck in the grind of the nine to five and you don't, you don't fully appreciate what you have or something. So when it obviously gets taken away, yeah, you do then have great, great, yeah, gratification of what, what, you, what you are doing and what you're able to do on a daily basis. So, yeah. No, definitely, and that extra motivation to push through, yeah, hundred percent. And yeah, and I think there's a fascinating uh, book that is, is and uh, called the eighty twenty um, rule or eighty twenty law. And um, I, I, I apply this principle to how athletes should use pleasure and pain. And uh, I, I hear some athletes that. Um, and people generally, you know, in like the kind of the self-help and motivation world, world talking about like motivation and pain and suffering and all and, and these kinds of things. And I think it has a place, but I think I also think when people talk about pain, um, whatever type of pain it is, emotional, physical, mental, um, I think it should be used, but should only be used to a certain certain degree. And I, I, I apply it to that 80-20, the, the 80 20 law in that respect that, that you should use pain, you know, 20% of the time to motivate you and drive you towards the pleasure of, of, of doing what you're doing. And because if, if athletes and people generally just keep using pain, you know, which is, you know, and, and the emotions which come from pain is, is sadness, is anger, is frustration, is resentment. Those emotions, long term, they will sap the energy from anybody because they are survive. They are the, the emotions of, of survival. You know, if, if we was to get into danger right now, if a guy broke into to this room that I'm in now, in that moment, I haven't got time to be being grateful, joyful, and all this sort, sort of stuff. I've got a decision to make. I've got to go and uh, and sprint and leg it away from this person if they're if it's a genuine real threat, or I've got to go and fight and, and, and take this person on. And that's why we have such powerful emotions that can go in in less than a second. Adrenaline, cortisol, testosterone can fire up and light up somebody's neurology so that your legs, arms, and fists can be ready to go and take action. But they are only temporary states. They're only temporary neurophysiological states that, that, that animals, including humans and all the other animals on the planet, that they're only those that, that faculty within within life is only there and supposed to be there for a short period of time. And I think sometimes people can get caught up in, in this whole thing about being an athlete uh, uh, and succeeding in other realms of life is it, about suffering and it's about pain. And uh, I just don't agree with that. But what I do agree with it is, is bottling it up and, and using it for those short moments of time uh, to accelerate and drive you on to, to, to going for the pleasure of 
achieving these things things that you want and it it certainly seems like that's kind of what you was able to you was able to take that 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 really awful event of you getting injured in that way but then using it as as fuel to to send you off and maybe even training it in a more motivated or or or, or different way yeah, yeah no no sounds sounds definitely about right no sounds sounds it so yeah so it, what do you think obviously we, we, we've spoken about how you know the physical demands of your sport is is you know so so it's yeah it's so demanding you you know you're, you're in the hurt locker a lot you you know the, the when lactic is building up you're constantly sitting aren't you on your lactic threshold <laughs> constantly yeah, yeah. in there constantly trying to nudge up your your threshold to a slightly higher and higher level because the only way that you're going to get fitter in your sport is, is to sit on that ana, uh, anaerobic threshold and keep pushing it up. But as we also spoke about, there is a mental side to all of this. And I know this is difficult and every uh, guest who's come on, I ask the same question. And at first they you know, can struggle with get getting to a number, but I asked them anyway. What do you think in terms of performing and get performing at the highest level in your sport like you are, what what percentage of it in your opinion is physical and what percent is mental? Because obviously you can't get away from the physical. You don't do that training, you're never gonna get into the position where you even need to test yourself mentally. <laughs> are, are you? For you, what what, did, what what does that what's that balance seesaw look like? Yeah, it's, it's it's always hard because you obviously see different athletes and, and their their physical makeup and and how they obviously you know you know that is obviously an advantage that you can't obviously get past and it's obviously you know they obviously got that from somewhere and obviously pushing through boundaries. You can you can argue that that was mentally they. They, you know, they they did that. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've trained with some fantastic athletes. I've been, I've been very lucky to train with some like incredible athletes. Um, and I genuinely think that that mental side is so much higher. Um, and from from different cultures as well, from Asian cultures and stuff like that. And and you hear about, um, um particularly about Asian culture, um, and how they're brought up, and and sometimes not in, not in the most the nicest way possible, but. They they mentally had to come through so much to 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 be where they were, um, and and it kind of makes you really appreciate appreciate the mental side of the game, and obviously if, but on that I would also then argue if some people go too far down the mental side and then try and give them mental challenges all the time you can burn out and obviously and 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 there are some coaches that potentially just go through. This, the, these exercises are just mental to, to get you mentally stronger and ignoring the f- physiology of it all and understanding that, you know, there are better way and smarter ways to train. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's always a hard balance. It is. And, and, and even when you talk, even when I'm talking about it, I'm contradicting myself there. <laughs> uh, it's hard because I've seen an array of athletes and even having a little chat with them about what they think and stuff like that and how I know their different coaches coach them. And sometimes I've seen training programs from different countries because I've trained with a host of countries from Hungary to Italy, um, or America. Um, so some big countries in the, in the world of short track. Uh, so you do see some programs and think, how the hell are we physically able to finish this program? Um, and then you see some athletes that do. So, and there is the element of, is that their physical capabilities or is it that there's something deep down inside them mentally? So no, it's, it's always a hard one. But for me, when I, when I talk about those 27 lappers and I'm five laps in and I'm feeling absolutely terrible and destroyed and then I manage to finish it, I feel like ment- the mental aspect's obviously going to be a big part. So I'd, I'd probably put it about 70-30. But physicality is obviously going to be a massive thing. Like the yeah. best mental prepared person can't just come into sport if their physicality is just not yeah. there. However, the best physicality, and I've seen some incredibly physically, like you can tell they're physically able 
and they just can't hack performance. They can't hack turning up on the day and putting all that they have out on that day. I've seen them do it in training countless times and periods, days and days. And then when they come on, when the spotlight's on and they can't, they can't put it out. So yeah, it's, it's, it's always a hard one. You're going to come back and forth and bring up examples. So, but I'll just keep it 70, 30 for that, for that respect. Yeah, that's great. No, thank you. I really like how you was, you know, as you said, formalizing how you was formalizing your answers. You, you, you've gone along there kind of bringing up the different elements and, you know, the, the, there's no, as we, as we said, there's no way around the physical, you can't take away the physical side of, of, of any sport. The, the fitness has to be there, the, you know, strengthening and conditioning has to be there. The, 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 the technical side of whatever somebody's sport is has to be there, you know, and if it's not there, you can be the most confident, you can be the most focused, you could get in the flow state every single time, you could do it every time, but if the, if, if the, if the physicality isn't there, it ain't there. And uh, there are shortcuts to enhancing the physicality that are. Um, and I, I know this, uh, but you can't get away from, from, from that. You, you, you just can't. Um, so, yeah, I find it, you know, really insightful listening to you there talking about how you said, you, you know, you've seen some super talented people who just, for whatever reason, when the spotlight is on, when the intensity grows and it becomes more pressurized that, that they couldn't handle it. Um, and then, th then that talent, that ability never comes into fruition then. Um, we, and I, and that's, that's a big reason why I, I do what I do because I, I, I mean, learn what I have learned. I, I, I find it so, uh, I find it heartbreaking for athletes who, who, who go through all of these struggles, you know, physically, mentally, emotionally, to get to achieving their dream. For me, the reason why an athlete shouldn't achieve their targets or goals should be that they're not good enough. You know, sometimes somebody just is better than you. You know, it should be that that they haven't trained enough, they haven't, you know, developed themselves, or they just wasn't committed enough to do it. It shouldn't be that nerves got the better of them, that, that a lack of belief got the better of them, that, 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 that the pressure in the moment was too much that they couldn't handle it. I, I just find it really, uh, I find it sad that that's, that's, that's often, not always, but often the reason why somebody or a team don't quite get it over the line. And what I'm so passionate about doing it is getting across to people that there are techniques, there are strategies, there are ways of developing your mental ability. You know, what, what I call the inner game. If you can, if an athlete cannot win the inner game, they will lose. And the great athletes across all the sports, in my opinion, were the masters of the inner game. They found a way to keep raising the bar over time. That is a mental thing. To get to the top and stay there, that is mental, you know, and to, 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 to be able to come back against the odds, to be the person that is renowned for, you know, taking the winning shot, you know, at Michael Jordan, you know that the, the whole team, if there's 10 seconds to, to go, they're setting it up so that Michael Jordan scores the winning basket with one second to go, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo, he is in his head, if there is... If there's 15, 20, 30 seconds left in the game, in his head, the only thing he's thinking about is scoring the winner, even if, you know, or scoring a goal that, that puts them in, into the lead. It, it, he's not letting his mind wander to doubt, to fear, to, 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 to waving off track. And it is a mental ability and it is a skill that can be learned. People can learn these things. Because if one person can do it, then someone else can. And, and a big part of what I do is understanding, again, is understanding from these great athletes how they did it. Because once somebody has a, a pattern to doing something, 
that pattern, once uncovered, can then be replicated to somebody else. It's, it's a neurological pattern. It's a mental pattern. But athletes can learn the mental patterns. And my, well, I, if you ever get to be around the, the world's greatest skater, the more questions you can ask that person to find out how they did things, that is probably the most valuable information that you can get. Um, because you can then put that and apply that inside your own mind like you did when you, when you, you know, I found it so fascinating listening to you for, I'll talk about when you, when you, when, when you beat your, your hero, you was able to get inside his mind almost and, and, and utilize how he performed to actually um, accelerate and enhance your own performance. Um, and and that, that, that's so powerful to be able to, be able to do that. Yeah, 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 no. Yeah, no, it is. It is, a, yeah, definitely a skill, 100% a skill that need, needs to be learned. And obviously, any athlete out there needs to, obviously, to adapt and also have some self-awareness around. I think that would be my key thing, would be to definitely have some self-awareness because one thing that, you know, it's obviously a, might work for somebody else, definitely might not work for you. So definitely get as many opinions out there and, and ways of doing things because it, it's it's we're all different so yeah yeah definitely um what's what's the um what's, what's the best advice that you've received from somebody you said you've had some really invaluable um, you know insights going to training with these different countries and looking at their programs i'm wondering if if, if in in doing that you've got to speak to some of their coaches or some of the athletes that are part of these different programs from other countries or or maybe it's somebody from you from 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 Britain is a piece of advice that, that's been given to you that which which you found you know invaluable at some point yeah um it's obviously it's obviously very hard to be putting on the spot but uh no um one 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 thing from a from a from a coach that was that was for me personally very very good but I had was uh, don't don't try and complicate things uh, sport is very simple and obviously what we're talking about this flow stage is if you, like we're, we're trying to keep it as simple as possible if we're talking about the best time you know you get into that point so I think you you can you can overcomplicate the simplest things to the moon right if you just keep thinking about it and you break it down to the milliseconds and stuff like that but I think yeah no I think probably probably the best thing is just to kind of understand what's important and obviously know that and don't obviously just ignore those facts and just keep going on. But obviously that you, you can overcomplicate things to, you know, the, the craziest degree. And I think for me, that was one of the best, best pieces of advice I got. Um, so for example, with the chimp, when one of the things I've been moving forward with um, and just, and just to go, go and just break it down. So just being like, this is, this is my mind works like this. And for me, that's, that's, that's the switch. And I don't overcomplicate it. I don't try and think about it too much. And, and then I, I'm, I'm in, my, fa in my, my phase. And obviously, that comes with experience. It's not obviously easy for these younger athletes. So, and, um, and obviously, it's going to be an, an element of trying and, and, and things. And obviously, with that, it's going to be failure. But yeah, that, that'd be one thing. Don't, for me, and any, any athlete that maybe overthinks things or definitely does that, yeah, try not to complicate it too much. Because at the end of the day, you love your sport and you're very good at your sport. For a reason, you know, and um, yeah, if you overcomplicate two things, you can definitely have too many cooks spoil a broth. So yeah, so yeah. What what is your superpower? I, I believe that all athletes um, have their, their their certain qualities, certain things that they do, um, which which helps them separate themselves. Because I think something sometimes athletes forget, no matter what level that they've got to. Just to get to to any level of elite sport, they have they beat off countless other people to get to there. There've been you know many many other people that 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 have tried to walk the path that you that you've walked and tried to get to two Olympics, one Olympics, and never even got there. And um, and in order to do that, you you have obviously some serious 
uh, abilities, whether they're, whether they're mental abilities or physical abilities. And I'm just curious to know uh, what you think is, is, is a superpower that you have that, enable, that has enabled you to perform and get to the level that, that you've got to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I say, you know, um, I, I, I wouldn't call it a superpower, but I guess you could call it a super strength was something that I'd always uh, put into. Um, probably one of mine is, is more speed skating related, but I feel like it also a little bit of element to maybe uh, mental as well. Uh, a one one part of mine is, is being able to be very relaxed at speed. So uh, a lot of the people that I train with is they, they call, they say, oh, you can do speed with your hands on your back. And that is literally something in our sport where you can either uh, skate your hands, like arms swinging as like you would be running or have it on your back relaxed. And I can go to very high speeds with it, hands on my back and maybe even not put my hands in the middle of the ice to hang to almost protect. So, and uh, I think that's an element of being very relaxed at speed. I can be quite relaxed and quite calm and uh, poised at certain high speeds. So that, that would definitely be a super strength of mine. So in a race, when uh, maybe everybody in the race is using their arms, maybe working a bit more harder, I can look like I'm very relaxed and calm and collected. So yeah, I definitely would say that would be a super strength of mine that I've kind of developed over the years and kind of trying to, yeah, push forward or forward even more. So, and, and for me, in my head, it's always trying to be as efficient as possible. So yeah, with the glide, like I talked about with the blades and my blade selection, it kind of part and parcel in with that so trying to be as, as efficient as possible so yeah awesome yeah well that certainly sounds like that is a superpower worth having in, in your sport and just uh, curious actually to to just uh, delve into that a little bit more so is it if somebody could choose to be able to skate like that because uh, yeah now you've seen it I, I have seen in the past where they, they've got them behind the back is, is that is that a preferred style that an athlete would get to? And it, you mentioned there about efficiency. Is that because if you've got your arms behind your back, you're not wasting energy with your arms? Is, is that the, the benefit of that, would you say? Uh, it, it, it can be described as that. It's, it's kind of been described in certain other ways. But for, like, for me, the reason why I do it is, is an element of like, uh, when I when I when I move my arms, maybe I don't. I'm not as relaxed or calm, or I cannot go into the flow state that we talked about. So for me, it's like an element of getting myself into that flow state, getting myself relaxed and calm, and getting myself in that poised in that mindset. But like at the end of the day, if you are flapping your arms about, you are wasting energy, an energy that's not necessarily maybe needed. Um, if you're accelerating which we obviously do at times. So you obviously need to use your arms and I do use my arms, but there are times where we are gliding and we're trying to move through the thing where having your arms on your back is the most efficient. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. So it would definitely be at times the best way that people would want to skate. So yeah. Nice. Cool. Um, my second to last question for you, Farrell, um, if you had three pieces of advice that, that you could give for either, you know, an, an up and coming skater in your sport or just a, an athlete in general, somebody who, who has this desire to, to make it to the top of the sport, to get to an Olympics. It, um, what, what piece of advice would, would, would you give to somebody that, that would help them get to the level that, you, that, that you've got to? Yeah, I, I think, yeah. The first piece of advice that I always give everyone just any, any works of life is it, people around you, surround yourself with the people that you want to, it doesn't matter, it, even in your friendship groups, if they're like drainers or anything like that, or, you know, surround yourself with people that give you energy that are obviously, you know, sparks of life, if, if that's what you want to be. But also, like, I've always been a big big person on have, have people that kind of inspire you, but also the people that you know and trust that can tell you, you know, the hard, the hard, hard lessons in life. And, you know, I have coaches and people in my past and like of all different age ranges that I surround myself with and that I'll come and be like I need a chat or something like that that have been vital so for any any upcoming athlete make sure you get those good people surround yourself anybody that thinks they can do it on their own or you know they obviously see them on the tv on their own when they're celebrating but they have I know they'll have 
a load of people in the background that they're on their phone constantly to. So definitely that one. Another one with that one is, and I've lived this, get yourself out of toxic environments. It doesn't matter how obviously bad it is. If that's a club, if you're at a football club or anywhere, or that is toxic, get yourself out of there. It doesn't matter how bad or serious the consequences is, uh, maybe at the time, uh, a toxic environment filled with maybe toxic people can be an incredible downfall and even a downfall on you mentally and also maybe even hating the sport. So that'd be, yeah, maybe the second one. Uh, and then maybe the third one, and then maybe these are not sport related as, as such, but uh, explore more than just sport. Uh, so for me, I lived in Italy, Hungary, Germany, and America. And I've absolutely loved living in these places. I've experienced different cultures and raised myself in different cultures and stuff like that. And for me, uh, maybe being in some toxic environments before uh, and then to doing that and embracing myself in cultures and meeting new people and stuff, it kind of really embraced my, my love for the sport again. Um, so sometimes being too sports driven and stuff is, is, is incredibly wrong. Like, uh, and maybe not, not the right thing to do. You, you might see yourself as a sports person, but you're definitely much more, you're a, you're a whole person and that can definitely feed into a better sports performance. Definitely for me, it was. So, and, and if that's a master's, no, if that's a degree or school or a course or anything like that, um, or hobbies, definitely, definitely explore more than just sport. Cause it will hundred percent help, help your performance in the end. So yeah. Well, that would be my advice anyway. Yeah, thank you for that, Farrell. I think you've given three wonderful pieces <clears throat> of, of, of advice there. Um, and I really like the last one, that, um, that, uh, that you had the guts to say that, that, that last point, because there is life outside of sport, and no matter who you are and what level that somebody gets to in sport, there is always going to be a life outside of sport, isn't there? And um, eventually it comes to an end, you know, for whatever reason, it's going to happen. It's going to stop. And, 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 and often athletes need a different life away from the sport to take, to take the mind away from it, to have, you know, to, to be able to get joy and fun from other elements um, so that you can escape from some of those challenging moments, whether it be you know something that went wrong in competition, whether it's just the fact that you've just been busted and got in training for a long period of time, and, and just being able to have that escapism, being able to have a life, you know, and as you said, that whole person. Because I think what, one of the traps that the athletes fall into is is that you know from such a young age, you know, they, they've grown up developing themselves as an athlete and, and that then becomes entwined into who they are as a person and so that when when failure comes when when things go wrong it becomes so personal to them because who they are is an athlete within that sport but they are always more than just a skater a rugby player a netball player a swimmer and um, so I think that's you know an amazing piece of advice that that you've given there, Farrell. Farrell. So, you know, thank, thank you for that. Well, no problem. Thank you. Uh, my, my last question for you is, is what, what's your definition of, of sporting excellence? What, what, what does sporting excellence mean, mean to you? Sporting excellence. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah that, that, that one's a tricky one. Uh, sporting excellence. Uh, I, for me, and I guess that goes into a little bit of my super strength and, and why I maybe do things the way I do it. It's like one of my idols is Roger Federer. Um, and like he would epitomize sport and excellence for me. I've seen him, I've been incredibly fortunate to see him live. And he just, the way he moves around the court and the way he does tennis, I was a big tennis fan when I was up. I used to play tennis a lot. And he would just, he would just make things look effortless and incredibly so, so well drilled. And he would just move and the flow of everything that he did was just incredible. Um, and I guess, that, I guess that that's something that I would strive to be like in speed skating. to make it look as flow and effortless as that. Um, and, 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 and that's what I would epitomize sport and excellence. So I guess maybe then the mental side and everything, like I'm, I'm trying to get that flow. I'm trying to get that, 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 
yeah, that kind of way of doing it. Because I know when you get into that flow and you get into that way of just making everything look easy, and obviously it takes incredible hard work and days of training to get there. Um, it, it, it leads to a fantastic success and obviously where you want to be in sport. So, yeah, for me, sport and excellence would be epitomised by Roger Federer. So, but that, but that's my my idol. I've always been my idol growing up. So, yeah, yeah. That's great. No, nobody has, has said that before. And I the word that was coming to my mind with that is effortlessness. You know, that, that effortlessness that it almost looks like that they're not trying but they obviously are, and 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 that that's that's where so much of a earlier in my the research that I was doing was was looking at people like that these the athletes that make it look like what they're doing is so easy, and um, and they can only do that because they one they have developed they've mastered their craft it's mastered, and once you've mastered the physicality then it's about mastering the mind and. And I remember, I don't know if you've ever seen it, the, the advert, the Nike advert with Roger Federer on, I think there's Roger Federer and Tiger Woods. And there might be another guy, it might have just been both of those two. And Roger Federer is talking about how um, he, he was built as this big talent when he was younger. And uh, at first he, he wasn't quite what he became. And I can't remember the exact words that he describes, but in the advert he talks about how it, it was only when kind of he he got control over his emotions. He used to like smash his rackets and break his rackets. You know, he used to be one of those typical tennis players that you often see, like getting into tantrums. And it wasn't until he learned how to control that that all like all his grand slams came. And when you look at somebody again, like like a Lionel Messi, that like effortlessness of going past people. One of the uh, basketballer who I've admired. Uh, it was a guy called Magic Johnson. What he did was, again, just bit take this this way of doing something so complex and made it so easy. And I, I I can definitely agree with you there that you've reached excellence when you are able to make something that is difficult look so easy. That's when you, you have mastered everything. You've mastered the physical game and you've mastered the the inner game and that that. That, that that is a great definition of, of excellence. I think that, I think that's probably my favourite that, some, that somebody's given there, Farrell. So that, that that is that is a great way of of uh, of wrapping up th this episode. And um, I've just found it so uh, insightful because it's you know skating, speed skating. It isn't a sport that that I know hardly anything about. I've I, I, I've watched it on TV and watched it as a kid and, and always found it fascinating and exciting, but without really understanding it. And, and you, you've certainly helped get a greater understanding of, of what it's like to, to actually do the event, but also how to actually train and, and prepare for it. So, you know, thank you, you know, so much for coming on and, 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 uh, and giving up your time like this. I, I, I really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm sure that anybody who watches this is, is going to find it so insightful. So, so thanks again for, for for coming on. No, thank you very much, Rob, for having me. And um, yeah, I hope I was uh, insightful or helpful to anyone uh, watching at home, and um, or at least interesting. So, thank you very much. Thank you for having so, me. You, you certainly have. So, thanks again, Farrell. Take it easy. Cheers, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. The Inner Game Podcast. Brought to you by the science of excellence. Unleash your power. Book your free consultation now.